Uh, thanks for having me today to tell our story. I started my journey with SAFE and using SAFE tools around 10 years ago. I started my life as a software tester, software test leader, and for the past 15 years, been doing test, uh, agile coaching and then agile coaching at scale. And over the past you know, seven years, been using SAFE 3.5, 4, 4.5, 5, and now 5.1. A few years ago, I left a company, a financial company, and I started consulting. <clears throat> and as I was consulting, I was, interestingly enough, finding that a lot of the transformations I was working on were having the same problems. And one of the first companies I started to consult with was S&P Global. I was lucky enough that the CTO at the time was a good friend of mine, and he asked me to come and help him with this transformation. One of the things that you should know about S&P Global, which is, was a gift that I didn't realize I was walking into, is five years prior to this journey, the CEO of the whole entire company stood up and said, we're transforming our company. We want to be this you know, fintech data, you know, best in class company, and we are going to move to agile ways of working. And so you know you've been given a gift, at least I know now, <laughs> that when a CEO stands up and says, you're gonna get this, it was a gift. And so as a consultant coming in and having this, this gift given to me, you know, it was a little easier, I will say. Um, and so I know that I, I know what I'm, the story I'm about to tell you, a lot of you might not have the same luck that I did. But I had this luck and I took full, full um, uh, I, I took it with, by, in, in, with charge. And so with that said, the first year I was consulting in one of these divisions, and I was just doing waterfall to scrum transformations. They are moving from project to product mindset. And it was going pretty well. It was small though, 10, 20 teams. It was the smallest division. So I knew that, I knew that this one was gonna be pretty easy, right? Um, but what was interesting is we started getting dictated to us certain processes. One of the other divisions were growing, and they were starting to, while they were growing, they were starting to see scaling problems. And so I think they must have hired a consultant and they came in and they started implementing safe tools. And when I say that, I realized the next thing I know, we're, being, we're given same cadence, you know, common cadence, and they're making us all have the same sprint length and same, they called it cycle and not program increment. They renamed it. You know how consultants do that, make it their own. <laughs> and, I was like, okay, so they're using tools that are safe, great. They don't want to call it safe because everybody's scared you know, to, to use that word. And so they started implementing some safe tools across all the division. And I was like, this is interesting. So my division was small, the one I was working on. 10 to 20 teams, didn't need many safe tools. About that time, my contract started coming up and one of the major the divisions that had just had a big merger and acquisition uh, inquired if I'd be interested to come help them out. This is where the, my story begins. So at that point in time, this is a story of growth. This company, uh, th this company had had a merger of equal size. It had two competing platforms that they were having to figure out which one do they want to choose. And when I got there, they had been doing Agile for about three years. And eh, when I say Agile, maybe they're doing Agile, not being Agile, but they were doing Agile and being Agile as best as they could on this common cadence, right? And so I started doing observations, thinking about what are they doing? What, what are the things that, what are the problems that they're running into? I started to do a lot of observations and I realized they had 200 scrum teams on a single train. <laughs> and I was like, oh my goodness. Um, and when the common theme, what was the problem with that? Well, the problem was, this is the problem statement they gave me. The problem statement they gave me was, we can't prioritize our work. And I said, well, how do you prioritize your work? And I said, they said to me, well, Mary, every quarter, we take our C-levels, three days, we lock them in a room, we take 300 to 400 projects, and we make them prioritize it. And they hate it. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah, I would hate it too. And so I actually went and interviewed the C-levels, and I said, okay, what, you know, what are the current problems? I, I like to think of about outcome-oriented transformation, so when I start with a why and understand what the problems that they are having, they said, this prioritization process is centralized. We can't do this anymore. We could do this when we were 10 to 20 teams. We can't do this at 200. This doesn't work for us. And so we, I said, you're right. Like, this doesn't scale. Let's think about how we want to move forward with that. 
Another common theme when I was interviewing the executives that we were having is the dependencies were really bad. When I say bad, like we're talking every project, and again, we were a project company at the time, had a dependency. And so they would prioritize this list, spend the three days, have a list of 200, and a lot of times they never got past 10 because the top 10 projects had a bunch of common dependencies because of the architecture that only a few teams could actually work on. I'm sure you've never had that problem. For us, we couldn't even get 10 down and we were full capacity allocated. We couldn't, we had 200 teams, but only could get 10 projects down. And they, they didn't realize that. They didn't have a way to visualize how many dependencies. All they heard was, we don't have enough skills. Well, they had the skills, but they didn't have the architecture to handle this um, either. So it was a big problem. The, the, the teams were frustrated. You know, all the teams heard was, we never get anything done. The clients aren't happy. And it wasn't their fault. They were doing this prioritized list. They were doing what they were told. The third problem was, I was starting to talk to the customers. And the customers kept saying, I don't really understand what they've delivered for me lately. Has anybody heard that before? It's, it's so common in these transformations. And the Scrum teams, they thought that they were, they thought they were killing it. Even though that they knew this prioritization process was crap, but what they were delivering was good. MPS scores at that time were okay-ish. Um, you know, we had some performance problems that was, you know, well known. And, but we had data that the clients won't, so the clients were still happy. They just wanted more data faster, sooner, right? And so when we started to think about it, <clears throat> and I was talking to the C-levels, I said, okay, we have, I think, three major whys. And I always start every transformation with, why are we doing this? What problems can I help you with? Not that, man, this is a, this is a typical safe transformation in the making right here. Like, I knew, like, this is how this should go. And they're like, Mary, we have, you've got to fix the central prioritization process. You've got to figure out how we fix our model with dependencies. And we've got to start to think about the customer first, because we know that customer centric organizations are the most successful. And I'm like, all right, I got my mar I've got my marching orders. I started to think, I didn't want to talk safe. I wanted to talk about how do we, how, what problems can we solve? And what tools of the safe toolbox can we utilize? And the and first thing out of my mind was LPM, right? LPM is all about decentralizing decision making, understanding where we're funding our investments, understanding how we, we get started. And so this is where I bring this, the leaders together and I say, okay, here, do we all agree that these are the problem statements? And they said, absolutely. And they said, if you can solve this, then that's a win. <clears throat> so the first thing I did was start to really understand who had high power, who had high interest. And you might think, well, Mary, you report directly into the CTO. Do you really need to do any type of stakeholder mapping or understanding? But you guys know. Stakeholders is what matters. You have to know who's in finance. You have to know who's in HR. You have to know who's in marketing, who's in sales, who influences strategy, who's the ultimate decision makers. And so I started to do a stakeholder map with everybody that was involved and who were my players? Who were the people that really had high interest and in who could make a change? And what I realized, it's probably not all too common, but it really was the president's the sea levels. It was them. They, you know, they made the ultimate decisions. And I started to think, okay, what would a first participatory budgeting look like? Participatory budgeting really is supposed to have more than just the sea levels, more than that executives. Who could I, can I just do it with them first, or should I try to invite the other folks? And it was interesting, about that time, I uh, realized that I was a little bit a fish out of water with this LPM thing. I had done a little bit of LPM before, but I had never went through the LPM class. <laughs> so I ended up hiring uh, Eric Wilkie here, from, uh, who's an SPCT, and Martin Olson, came in and taught me LPM, and they started talking about stakeholder management. Eric yesterday did a class just about you know, teaming and stakeholders and how this matters. So even though it's not on my slide, one of the stakeholders I wanted to mention here is, if you've never done this, one thing you should know is maybe get an LPM training from somebody who's done a lot of it, right? It's, it's to help you with the model, help you answer these questions. And for me, one of my first questions to them was around stakeholder management. 
And they said to me, Mary, you, you've got the base of it. Everybody you've told me who's in the players, in the, in the white right quadrants, you just have to do something with that now. And so I went to the president at the time, I was lucky enough to have a skip level with her, and I said, I think I know who all the stakeholders are, validate it with her. I know there are other stakeholders that could actually really infect my planning, but I said, I think for this first participatory budgeting session, I only want your directs in there. She that said, that's fine. I said, but here's my worry. I need somebody who's an ultimate, like you need to empower somebody here if we can't get decisions, <laughs> even though participatory budget, everybody's participating, I need you to, to mark somebody as the person to make a final decision. And she did, and she let her whole OPCO know that this person would be the ultimate decision maker if we couldn't work it out as a group. And I thought that was really key to help us through that. Now, so my point to you on this is it really matters who the decision makers are, who has strategy insight, who has the interest. And the other thing that I found is because they had this power and interest, they, I actually got them through a leading safe class. I know, a gift. I know that doesn't happen everywhere. You're best if you get the two hour, you know, safe for intro for, for executives. But I got the C-levels into the leading safe class. And that really helped with the understanding of the decisions that they had to make, okay? So really understand the stakeholders, really understand who's the decision right makers, and try to get them into those trainings so that they understand their role. So my mom was an accountant. I grew up thinking I was gonna be an accountant. I took my first accounting class and I realized really quickly that I don't understand the difference between a debit and a credit. <laughs> I still some days don't realize what the difference is between debit and credit and I've been in financial software for about 15 years. Um, but anyways, I got my own money and then I figured it out. But with that said, Coming into LPM, you have to understand the differences between de debit and credits. One of the biggest challenges I've had is understanding financial systems. We have monolithic financial systems. They're silo-based functions. They report on silo-based functions. They don't, they don't, well, maybe you're lucky. Yours isn't set up to, if yours is set up to, to report out in value streams, raise your hand. One, I mean, it, you're lucky. Right? When you start, typically, you don't have that luxury. And so when I started to think about what are the financial levers that I need to understand about my, my economics of, of, of how we're gonna do this and, and what LPM is and how much do we have to invest, I just said, well, let's just start with, how much does it cost for a scrum team? Has anybody been able to run a report, go to your finance person and run a report, and all of a sudden they're like, oh, a scrum team costs you know, $5 million or whatever. Has anybody ever been able to do that? Couple, at my companies, I've never had that from day one, right? So I've had to go in and figure out, and that's what I had to do here. Okay, what does Workday say? Who's in technology? <laughs> what, is, what does this project management system say? Well, who's on what Scrum teams? By the way, that hasn't been updated in two years and, and those teams don't exist any longer. And six months later, I still am trying to figure out who is on a Scrum team and how much the Scrum teams cost. And by the way, Product is in different orgs, so we can't get their funding. We have to go to product and get their finance partner and get their costs and come back to understand the full cost of the scrum team. So six months into this, I'm, I'm like, I have got to understand how much money do I have to even play with to take it into participatory budgeting, right? And so when I start to, start to understand what are those characteristics, you know, scrum team costs is important. Understanding your financial systems and how they work is important. The next thing I started to do as we were going into participatory budgeting is the epics. Okay, epics, lean business cases, this should be easy. And a team started to write their epics in the next in the lean business case. And I'm looking at the cost and I'm looking at the ROI and man, it was way inflated. I'm sure nobody's ever seen that either. And then I looked at this another epic and I'm like, wow, I can't even compare these two. Right, the, the, this one was cost modeled this way and this was ROI this way. There was no commonality between these. And I was like, okay, what are we gonna do here? So I spent a month with finance business partners and we created a cost model template so that every epic could be modeled the same way. And then I spent another month working on the ROI template so that the, the lean business case, the ROIs would be you know, done the same way. And so I'm like, God, this is hard. <laughs> There's so much you have to figure out. And so we spent, finally we got to a point where 
I was like, great, we're ready for our first story budgeting. I know how much budget we have. I know, I feel good about the epics. I feel good about the modeling of it. I can compare apples to apples. And we're getting there, we're playing around, and we're doing, you know, fit, doing the exercise. And then halfway through, one of the C-level says, well, what about the, what about the um, money that we've got over here on the side for this project? Have you included that in the funding? And then somebody over here says, well, can we capitalize this? Because if we capitalize this, this is a different funding bucket, and we can also do this. I'm like, wait a minute, wait a minute. I've been asking you guys for like a, a year, is this all the money that we have to invest? And they're like, oh, we forgot to tell you about that. <laughs> and so I'm sitting here thinking, oh my goodness. And so we pivot, and I'm trying to gather, okay, can we play with this money? Is this money ours? Is this val valuable? My point being is, there's magic money that comes up from everywhere somehow. <laughs> And you have to understand where those levers are and how to pull them, right? Um, so understanding your financial characteristics is really important. Now, it took me six to eight months. You know, new division, I could probably do it now. Now that I understand those things, that knowing exactly what I'm asking, I could probably do it in a month or two. But before understanding that, before starting, I, I didn't know that you had to know all these things. <clears throat> so once we started and I, we, we and we started to think about what our value stream is going to be. I was like, all right, let's run a value stream workshop. And where this is, you know, I don't know about you guys, but sometimes the word workshop scare people or, you know, value, like value streams. I still don't understand what you're talking about. Trying to give them education. And remember, they went through Lean Safe class, so I was able, they, they understood the concept. During that time, I started to realize, at least for us, and I was a little luckier this way, is that the business was already actually kind of working in a value stream way. It's just that technology wasn't working that way. Remember, technology was on this one value stream, 200 scrum teams for us. And they were not aligned to the businesses the way that everybody else was. And so for us, I was like, okay, I could do this big value stream workshop, or I could just align technology to how the value stream, how the product business was already set up. And we had multiple conversations of, is the business actually set up correctly? Does this align to our strategy? Does, you know, can we actually get value out if we're set this way up? It wasn't perfect, but it was good enough. And so I decided, let's start there. We all know that at some point in time that this changed. So we, we decided in the line technology of the business and I don't know if you guys ever had this problem, but we started to put scrum teams into the, the value streams, and we didn't have all the skills needed to get the you know, value out to production. I see lots of heads shaking. I mean, it's common, right? To actually be able to say, now do we, you remember, if you remember one of our problems was, we had these platform teams that were these dependency teams, and we didn't have enough of those teams to actually do the work. And so when we went to put those teams in the value streams, or do we leave them in a horizontal value stream that still supports everything across, we did not have enough of those things. We it became very visible that we needed more. We churned probably two months trying to align teams into the first value stream because if they, you know, finance, we want to make it perfect. And I said, guys, it's not going to be perfect. We have got to start somewhere. I said, we knew, I told you from the beginning, you probably only have 60%, 70% of the skills needed to get this work done. Let's start. Finally, they did. They finally just said, okay, you're right, Mary, let's just get started, and then we'll put in time for KT, yes. We'll have an extra, you know, additional skill uh, training for, you know, using Pluralsight, all of our free LinkedIn learning stuff, yes, yes, but we've gotta get started. And that's really what this slide, this is about from an LP perspective. As you are starting, there are certain things that you, it's not gonna be perfect. Other things, we've talked about it already, you know, value stream's not gonna be perfect. The way we started our value stream in those business lines, tw tw 24 months later, you wouldn't recognize them, right? But we iterated, we experimented, we made through and figured it out. OKRs, I don't know if anybody went to Yuval's OKR session yesterday. Our OKRs at first were horrible. They were, you know, I really tried to get them out of that output mindset. Remember, we were project-based perspective. We were trying to move to a product-based, put the customer center in everything we do. And the first ones, we, we probably spent two months, I don't know if anybody else is in your finance, but you know, we put OKR on the screen, it's like, oh no, now my performance is gonna be about, you know, my performance bonus is based on these OKRs, you know, everything is based on these OKRs, this has gotta be perfect. And I kept telling them, guys, this is not gonna be perfect. 
We don't know what our, you know, this is our first time we've ever done this. Just let's get something out and, and see if we can iterate on it. And we did. And the first ones were, if you guys were just, I'm actually kind of, I would, they were good. <laughs> they, they were good. But we, we did it every quarter. We would look at them every six months and we, we made them better. And it got to a point where we could really align our strategy to our OKRs, our strategic things to our OKRs, and understand what the real outcomes were for the year. And we cascaded that all the way down to the portfolios, to the value streams. And at PI planning, every quarter we would show on the screen. The other thing that we got stuck with is epic writing. I don't know how many of you guys have went through and churned on epic writing. But epic writing and wanting those lean business cases to be perfect. Oh, I have to, we have to do more research on the epics and more on the business cases. These costs is I'm like, you're not, it's never gonna be right. It's never gonna be perfect. You just have to start. <clears throat> and then roadmaps. So trying to get away from these project-based mindset to this roadmap-based mindset is, is tough. And, and having to think that once it's on the roadmap does not mean you are tied to that. The roadmap's a forecast. It's a forecast of where you're heading. It doesn't mean that the project is definitely gonna be done. So when, I did, when we first rolled out LPM, we first had our roadmaps out, it was almost like people were exposing their souls. <laughs> And they were so afraid that they were going to be held to that. But I said, look, guys, it's a forecast. We can do this. We'll iterate on it. We'll experiment. We'll pivot. It will be OK. So the point of this is just start. It's not an art. It's an art, not a science. It, you will work through it. You'll have your experiments. You'll learn from it, and it will evolve. We talked about OKRs just a minute ago, but I don't think people really understand how OKRs can shift a mindset. We were a project-based mindset company, right? So, you know, you funded projects. If a project overran, you were overfunding, you were over dates, you were over time. You're not going to meet your outcomes or your output, really. And as we, we were writing our OKRs, I said, guys, I said, we need to have these be outcome-oriented. We need to move forward with that. What I don't think people understood is, is that transition. It, and it's a culture shift. And I, the story of how this goes for us is, I don't know about last six months last year, I don't know how many of you guys went through, had uh, the great resignation and had you know, lots of turnover. Well, we had had a really, so we had launched our trains a couple of years before. Everything was going really well. And really, 20, you know, last year at the beginning, we were starting to hit all the things, good things about SAFE. We were starting, our trains are executing, we're predictable. We were just, we're killing it. And what was interesting is that first six months, we were, I mean, everything was green, you know, because everything has to have access and finance. Everything was green, all of our OKRs, all of our epics were in good shape. And then halfway through the year, when we started to have people slowly resigning and people saying, oh, our deliverables, our, our features are gonna roll over to the next sprint, all the opco starts to freak out. Mary, what's happening? We were doing so well. I said, you know, we're losing these people, we're losing knowledge, what's going on? And I said, I said, hold up, it's okay. What, what's the problem? And they're like, well, you know, we, we missed our date. So that means that we're not gonna have an outcome. I'm like, is that true? All of our OKRs today have been good. And so I kept talking to them, what's the problem? What's the problem? And they just were, had this fear, just because that they missed, rolled over two or three features, that the outcomes weren't going to be hit. It took me, I think I had, 10 meetings with the Opco. And I finally broke it down to them this, this way. I said, on our epics, we had our MVPs, and we prioritized the most MVPs first. And those were, a lot of times, the most valuable. We did those MVPs in, through January through June. The MVPs that we have left are sometimes like the more nice-to-haves, not the required. And I said, because we prioritized the right work, and because we executed well in the first half of the year, our OKRs for the end of the year are still fine because we met our outcomes based on how we, we've you know, really pivoted when things didn't go right and prioritized the right value first. But that mindset shift, you, you have, my thing to you guys is without those OKRs, you would have thought we failed last year. But it was because that we had the OKRs that we were saying, say, no, we're still successful. So it is really key. And they might not have been perfect OKRs, but it was good enough to show that we still were able to, to accomplish what we said we wanted to do. So 
So what, this slide is weird. When I was talking to Mark Rickers about it, he's like, Mary, what are you trying to say here? <clears throat> and for me, the story went with something like this. LPN brings a lot of transparency. What do I mean by that? It's in my, I had a um, product a line, an art, and a, a business leader who was almost the poster child for innovation. And for the past two years, he had touted around his awesome new tool and product that was going to do all the things for the clients and had gotten significant investment, right? It was a Horizon 2 thing. And we knew we weren't going to make money the first two years. But his, problem, his statement to us was, hey, we are going to make money after two years. We're going to have some type of funnel. So two years in, we, we're tracking these investments. We're tracking whether or not the, the bets that we're placing by these epics are actually doing what the epic said it was going to do. And we realize, as we get to our, our six-month participatory budgeting, two years in, zero revenue. When we were about to go to the participatory budgeting site, he pulls me aside and says, Mary, we can't show this. I'm like the poster child for innovation. Like, I've been you know, on site touting all these great things. And you know, I know I said I would have revenue in two years. It's coming. <laughs> it's coming. And I just need you to not show this. And I said, look, I said, I can't hide it. That's my job is to raise the transparency. He said, he said what can we do? I said, we don't have, I said, well, I don't know. I said, would you like to go and talk to, and talk to, to your, your boss at the time, who was on the OPCO, and say, how do you plan on fixing this so that when he gets into the meeting, he's not blindsided that, that this is the data that's going to show. So he did some recon, and we get into the participatory budgeting, and he had a significant investment. I mean, it was significant. And it, we came to a point where we had to make a decision. Do we invest continue to make that investment in his work with zero revenue, or go after a $30 million piece of work. And you would have thought that I was stealing his baby. <laughs> and I probably was, right? I mean, it, and I understood that, and I felt horrible about it. But some bets don't place, they don't land. Some bets just, you know, you can build something, and that's why I would never be in product, and, the, and it just doesn't do what you wanted it to do. We went through, the, that was the hardest participatory budgeting we ever had. Because his boss also knew that he was post child for innovation. <laughs> and that that made him look good. But the innovation wasn't paying off. So what we, what we did, we partially funded it. We continued to invest that we know, you know to give him enough to get him over the finish line to hopefully uh, be able to, to, win, to win the game and, and make some investment. But we took the other half of the investment and moved over. It didn't make me a fan of that guy, still to this day. <laughs> and not a fan of SAFE and the transparency it brings. And so what I'm telling people and telling you guys here is it has its ups and downs. The C-levels love the transparency, right? But he didn't. And, and you just really need to, it, you know, it helps you align strategy with execution, right? It helps you govern the strategy but it doesn't mean that people are going to be happy with the outcome. So just prepare yourself for that. When we think about at the end of this and the three whys of where we ended up, central prioritization process, LPM allowed us, to, and participatory budgeting, allowed us to decentralize the decision-making into the value streams. So we wanted the OPCO, the C-levels, Focusing on where we invest, how does it align with our strategy, and are we putting our bets in the right place? And then we've empowered the people local to make the decisions. I, that was the biggest win for us, because then we could move faster. And, and, the, and the C levels were just ecstatic that they didn't have to be holed up in, you know, in a room for three days to, to really understand this. Secondly, we started tracking those dependencies. And I think if you remember the, the values of flow that uh, uh, Leff Dean Leffingwell was talking about yesterday, removing bottlenecks. We started out with 400 dependencies every PI. And at the end, we were at 200. Now, it took two years to get to 200. Half of that was done, was structured and moved into value streams. The other half was a focus on the monolithic application and putting in, in the technologies. Others was, was upskilling folks. So we increased productivity that way for sure. I, can I give you the exact productivity number? 
know, but I can tell you lead time did increase just because we, we started to remove those dependencies. And from a customer centricity perspective, I'm happy to say we had the highest NPS score that we ever had for our product. And that's what all that really mattered to us. So thank you for today, and uh, I'll take questions. All right, we haven't gotten any in the app quite yet, but did anyone have questions? Oh, they are? Okay. So. <clears throat> this, this is an experiment, I love experiments. <laughs> we asked, should we experiment? Mary said, yeah. I am good with experiments. <laughs> Everything, everything's an experiment. All right, I'll read it out for some personality. Which role in the business helped develop your OKRs? So we had portfolio level OKRs, value stream OKRs, and art level OKRs. So we had a leadership team that, that at each of those levels. So you had the business, the product, the dev leader, the QA leader, and they, they created the OKRs together as a team. So it wasn't just one role. It was the team of folks at each level creating OKRs there for us. Uh, next for Matthew, what level within the business had the knowledge to be able to prioritize and fully understand the portfolio backlog? For example, VPs versus a portfolio management group. Yeah, that was an interesting one. So um, I was actually really impressed with my C-levels of how invested they were. Because they were always you know, tucked into this room <laughs> of three months, they really understood business priority. They really understood the epics and, and the strategy. So they were probably more invested than maybe some of your C-levels were. But because we had always included them, I was lucky that when we, when we went to this model, they were fully, you know, they could fully understand, here's our strategic themes, we had five. Here were the epics that we knew that would fund those or, or extend that strategy. And so they, they, they were just as committed um, at the C level as the portfolio leadership team. How is participatory budgeting going today? Was that approach fully adopted? So we did add extended stakeholders. I will tell you it, did, it wasn't as good as my C levels. We added more people from their directs and because they were so invested in their baby or their, their, their ideas, when you try to lift them up and pull them out and say, hey, look at the whole landscape across the whole business, they still had their blinders on. And so I will be honest with you and say, I've limited, in my, and I will limit in my future um, rollouts, how many people are in participatory budgeting. I need the people that can look at the business and make the right decisions for the business, not just their value stream or not just their art. From Bria, to what degree was the shift in budgeting affected by financial and reporting policies as a public company? How did you work with finance on the process and reporting they needed to maintain for legal purposes? So that is an amazing question. And what I'll tell you is still manual today because they can't change the financial systems to fully fund the value streams because they would have to re-forecast the financials to, since we were a public company. So we've started, we fund value streams manually on paper, but the financial systems, and we're starting to put in things in our financial systems like value stream code and unit, using unit codes in some of the, in the systems, um, but we haven't fully moved because we, they didn't want to reforecast financials on this new model. So it's a, it's, it's a, it's a journey. Hopefully, you know, we're going to get there one day. All right, from Katie, any advice on how to influence and gain sponsorship from CFO and finance execs with moving to participatory budgeting and OKRs versus hard benefits in project business cases? I am that person who, I'm the bridge person, influencing technique I really, uh, that, that we talked about yesterday. So my, I bridge, my goal is to bridge all the different disciplines. I have, you know, bi-weekly, you know, monthly uh, with the CFO, all the C-levels, I have those conversations about, you know, what, what problems are we having, how are we trying to get, get there, um, why we have these OKRs, et cetera. And what I found is finance was more invested than anybody, at least in my company, because they, they were almost like Switzerland. They could actually look above all the other business problems and really understand, 
hey, how we should invest our money and, and finally get a say in where we should be placing those bets. Um, so the sponsorship from the CFO and finance was up for like, what they knew, when you think about the Cotter model, they knew that the urgency to change was there. And so they were willing to create some flexibility and buy in to try something new because they knew what we were doing wasn't working. It wasn't fully aligning the strategy to execution. So it's a little, when, you have, when you create that urgency and that why, it's, it's easier in to, in to build those bridges. Do you consider OKR as input for strategic portfolio review or rather an outcome of SPR through cross-functional leadership alignment? Oh, great question. I use it as an input. Um, that, so the way we do it is we have our OKRs and our EPICs. And so we, before, again, RAG statuses. We have RAG statuses for those OKRs and for those EPICs when we go into the SPR. Uh, and we have changed the OKRs sometimes. I would say it's, I'm a Beth person, it's like 10% of the time we've changed OKRs based on the RAG statuses to make them go green. You know, But typically I try not to change the OKRs, um, at least for one, maybe more, no more than once a year, unless we have a good, big pivot. If we pivot, I fully am flexible to do that. Were EPICs prioritized using portfolio WSGIF or a different method? Curious how prioritization relates to the project of the poster child for innovation. Yeah, so poster child of innovation happened before we did our first participatory budgeting. Um, so that's how that happened. Um, and he was also the hippo, no, 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 he was no, the loudest person in the room, the best sales guy. So that's how he got all the money. I mean, typical, perfect. So the, um, from the, so what's interesting, when we did the first participatory budgeting, I went back and forth, do I want to do the, do I want the C levels to go through WSGIF? Like I just, you know, it's a lot of different variables and I just went through this brain exercise. But they did, they didn't have any problems with it. And so what was interesting is we did WSGIF, but then you have to look at your horizons. And a lot of times a WSGIF does a lot of stuff, prioritizes a lot of stuff in horizon one, right? This is stuff that can make an immediate impact. And we still need to invest in horizon two and three. So WSGIF helps them prioritize first, you know, horizon one, but we would, you know, maybe number 15, we needed to work on in the fund because we need to work on horizon two. And maybe number 30 <laughs> was, you know, horizon three, but we still invested in it. So, I would just say use WSGIF, but don't forget about your horizons if you do that. What was the number one lesson you received uh, from resetting your value streams? Top tip going through it. Just keep saying it's an experiment and you're gonna learn and you're gonna iterate on it. I don't know what else to say about that. I mean, and I just tell them, look, we're gonna learn, we're gonna pivot. I mean, we get into a situation where if we go back to the, the, the poster child of innovation story, it was its own art. But we, when we defunded it, it didn't have enough teams or enough funding to actually be an art anymore. And so we had to take that and move it. And that, again, the guy still hates me, but you know, it is where it is. And to go through that, it was just like, guys, business has, here's our strategy. Here's how we're aligning our strategy, make sure we're funding the right pieces of that. And so having to, you know, just, Hey, we knew if this was an experiment from the start, we knew funding was gonna change and that we would have to pivot, here is a pivot. So it's just, it's kind of normalizing it too and normalizing that this is normal. So we're gonna have these experiments, we're gonna learn, but know that we're gonna have to continue refine these things. All right, we have time for one final question. How are your OKRs aligned with EPICs? One to one, many to many? I really try to, to not to do that. So I usually say three to five OKRs. You can have as many EPICs as you want to. Try to keep it simple, simple, stupid. Within the OKRs, I try not to have more than like three to five KRs. <laughs> so three to five objectives, three to five KRs in each objective. Um, and I don't like going one to one, though it happens sometimes. Um, sometimes I've, I've had to back into the OKRs from the EPICs. Right? But I try to really say, are these epics similar and can we get the same outcomes in, you know, into this OKR? I just went through this again with another division I'm in. Um, so I try not to, but it sometimes happens. We got one last bonus one. How many epics do you review at PB and do you have one or multiple portfolios? Um, in the case I was talking to you about the, the, uh, the story, we had 10 portfolios. 
Um, and so we, I, I try to limit progress, limit the work in progress, limit the epics, you know, that we take to store budgeting. So think about how many epics have we finished the last six months? How many should we take into the next? So really try to say we finished 10, we should really only bring 10 into PB. And we can always bring in more if we get something done. Uh, so really trying to use WIP limit, what we've done in the past as a way to forecast how many we need to get ready for in the future. All right, well, that's our time. Thank you so much, Mary. Very captivating. <laughs>